Hello, guys. But my God, it's a full house. You guys need to question your life decisions. I think there are other, there are other things to do. Hi, my name is Giles. Yo, I've got a prop. I haven't gone shopping. The prop will make its view uh, uh, um, and come out in, in, in a second. So listen, my name is Giles Yo, and I'm based at the University of Cambridge, and I study the genetics of obesity and the genetics of how our brain controls food intake. I'm not actually going to be talking about that today. I'm actually going to be talking about something else I've been thinking about. Because as we're understanding the genetics of body weight and so the biological variation between why we all behave differently in this environment that we actually live in, I began to realize that if we don't understand the environments that we're actually living in and we don't actually think about that, we're never going to fix the problem. And so this is almost my... Uh, um, reflections, you, you know, over the past couple of years, through both through broadcasting and then through writing a book, to talk actually about diets. And diets are an interesting thing. Whenever we talk about diets, our face scrunches up. You know, it's a really, it's it's, a, it's become a toxic word to us, which is an, a really a sad thing to, to to see because because diets actually come from the Greek word dieta, which means a way of life. And what a beautiful thing, right? When we're talking about diets, we should be talking about a way of life, but we're not. We're not talking about a way of life. We're talking about now something I would argue is quite toxic. It's full of pseudoscience, and there's a lot of things out there which are just simply not true, and it's full of fear. And the last thing we should be doing is fearing our food. Now, people go on diets for many, many different reasons, and I'll use the diet in its toxic term here for a second. People go on diets because maybe they've become diabetic, maybe they've got irritable bowel syndrome, maybe they've got high blood pressure. But for the vast majority of human beings out there, when we say diet and when we talk about diet, we're trying to lose weight. Now, there are many diets that are out there. There's a whole emporium of, of, of diets, and you can see some of, some of them that are, actually, that are actually out there. Now, there are some which are entirely BS, for lack of a better term, okay? And they have no basis, no basis at all, and I shan't talk about those today because this is New Science is Live, and I figured, let's talk about some science. But what was surprising when I began this, this trip a couple of years back is that actually the vast majority of diets out there do work in the short term for some people. It is just very, very rarely for the explanation on the side of the tin or, or, or on the website. And so, this is what I, I want to talk to you guys about the truth about diets and how the diets that do work actually work. So this is the book I wrote, Gene Eating is a play on clean, uh, on, on, on clean, clean eating, and in effect, it's a, it's a story of human appetite, and in which, uh, as I do so, I also then begin to actually speak about, uh, speak about, various, about various diets. Now, when I was actually wandering around publishers trying to get the book sold, um, everyone asked me this question. They go, at the end, they go, but well, where's your plan? Where, 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 where's your plan? I'm going, what plan? Your diet plan, the yo plan. Did you read the book? There is no plan, okay? I mean, I guess that's the, that, that's the point, and that's going to be the theme of this, is that there is no singular plan because there is no singular human being. We are all different, and without sounding like a fortune cookie, you know, we all have to be, we all have to be us, okay, for, 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 for that. However, when I was writing it, a couple of things, a few things emerged, truths, okay, that are based on biological fact. And rather narcissistically, I've called these your truths. Um, and and I've, this is how I'm going to actually stick the talk together, okay? I found six of them. There are probably more, okay? But six your truths. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to spend probably more time on a couple of them than others. But you'll see where, 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 where we're actually going to go with that. All right, your truth number one. Do you know what the problem with losing weight is? It ain't easy. I think we all know it, 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 it ain't easy. Therefore, your truth number one. It ain't supposed to be easy. So I'm a geneticist by trade, and I think being a geneticist is a perfectly upstanding thing. My mother-in-law still speaks to me. This is, this, this is all a good thing. But the moment people ask, oh, what do I study? What disease do I study? What mechanism do I study? And I say, I study body weight. I study obesity. Immediately, I become the bad person. And I become the bad person because I'm perceived as giving fat people, overweight people, people with obesity, all terms I do not use in a pejorative fashion, an excuse, which philosophically is 
to me, has always been interesting, okay? Because if I was studying the genetics of dementia, the genetics of arthritis, the genetics of cancer, would I suddenly be giving those people suffering from those diseases an excuse? No, right? I'd be trying to figure out a mechanism, I'd be trying to do something about it. But yet, when we talk about body weight, of which obesity just sits on one end of the spectrum, I am suddenly giving those people an excuse. And the reason is this, okay? I think all of us have seen the versions of these scales of justice from, from, from everywhere. It's otherwise known as the first law of thermodynamics, okay? So you can't, you can't invent energy from anywhere and you can't magic the energy away. The only way you can gain weight is to eat more than you burn. And the only way, ladies and gentlemen, the only way to lose weight is to burn more than you eat. You guys are thinking, eat less and move more. We lined up to listen to this. But, but, it, but, but it's true, okay? Because, because at the end of the day, that is the physics, and we cannot, diets still have to follow the laws of physics. But that's the how, okay? That's how we gain weight, how we lose weight. The, more important, the most important question is why. Why do people behave differently around food? Why do people have different likings of food? Okay, just, just as an example, okay? My wife loves chocolate, she loves chocolate. So she tells me not to buy any, because if I buy any and put it in the house, then she will track, them, she will track the remainder down like a stinger missile and actually eat it all. So she says, don't have it in the house. I said, okay, I won't. Now, me and chocolate, meh, it's okay, right? I'll eat it if there's a dessert there, but I'm not gonna track it down. Now, pork scratchings, hmm. So, so, this is a, so, so my house is a chocolate and pork scratching free house. This is not a party house, you, you, you know from it. But built within that slightly facetious argument is, A, a it's true, it's not, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it is true, is that it's not facetious because built into there, we have a situation where some people prefer sweet foods. This is, this is true. Some people prefer savory foods or fattier foods. So if the government today decides that we're gonna cure obesity by banning chocolate, this is what we're gonna do. Well, it's only gonna work for 50% of the people, 30%, because my son is like me, 30% of the people in our household, whereas us pork scratching lovers are not gonna be affected at all. We need to understand how people behave around food. And what is it, my liking or dislike for chocolate? rather than pork scratchings or what, or what have you. Is that willpower? Is that moral fiber? No, there's gonna be a huge amount of biology that, that, that is there. And we know this, and I can, these guys are signing books at the moment. Thanks, so thank you for being here. Okay, I, I appreciate it. The Ventolican twins. So we know that there is huge biology when it comes to body weight. And when we read biology, we have to talk about genes because of twin studies. Now, why, why twins, right? Just very briefly, we have identical twins and we have non-identical twins. Now, identical twins share all of their genetic material with each other, 100% of their genes, whereas non-identical twins would share as much genetic material as you would with your own brother or sister or your parents, 50%. So you could take any given human trait and ask what happens when you share all your genes versus what happens when you share half your genes and then work out the heritability, the percentage of a given trait which is going to be genetically related rather than environmentally related. Every single human trait, every single human trait and behavior will have a genetic influence. The trick is to try and figure out how much of an environmental impact there is. Let me give you an example. If I had hair, my hair would be black. And I would argue that hair color is very powerfully genetically influenced with very little environmental impact. Ladies, peroxide does not count, all right? Now, how about, let's take a look at something else. How about freckles? Now, freckles are clearly gonna have an environmental influence. Sorry, freckles are clearly gonna have a genetic influence, but whether or not they appear, how many appear, even amongst identical twins, will de depend on whether or not I wear T-shirts. Do I like to stand in the sun? So there we have, a powerful genetically influenced human trait with an equally powerful environmental impact. Now, if you do that math, then what happens is the heritability, ladies and gentlemen, of body weight is 70%, okay? Now, it's not zero, and certainly not 100%, but it is pretty high. And just to give you some perspective, the, um, the heritability of height is 85%. So it's not as high as height, okay? But it's certainly approaching that of height. And we now know of over 300 genes that influence our feeding behavior, all right? So, and, and, it's, and, the vast majority, and the vast majority of them function within the brain. So what 
information does your brain need in order, to, in, in order to influence food intake? It needs to know, broadly speaking, two pieces of information. It needs to know how much fat you have, and that's because how much fat you have is how long you would last in the wild without any food. Okay, if your food stopped today, how long will you keep going for? So it's an important piece of information to have in your head. Maybe not today, but certainly in the past when we never had enough food. The second piece of information which it needs is it needs to know what you have just eaten and what you're currently eating. And those signals are going to come from your gut. So these 300 genes I'm, I'm, I'm telling you about, some of them influence the sensitivity of our brain to the signals. So, for example, if I was carrying 20 kilograms of fat on me, and these are then going around and, and, and signaling to, to, to my brain, but my brain only senses 18 kilos of it, well, then it's thinking, well, hang on a second, I thought I had 20 kilos of fat on board. And so your brain drives you to get to 20 kilos of fat, but you already have 20 kilos of fat. What happens then? You gain weight. You're heavier than the person next to you. Okay, you see where I'm going here. Imagine if you ate 1,000 calories for lunch. Just imagine that. But your brain only sensed 800 calories. Well, it's going to drive you to eat more, even with the exposure to the same food, to the same environment as your husband, wife, son, daughter, and yet you end up eating more because of biology, because of your genes. So the bottom line is some people are always going to find it more difficult to say no, even in exactly the same environment and scenario as someone else, because of their biology. Okay, people who are overweight are not morally bereft, they're not weak, they are fighting their biology. Yo truth number two. Now, yo truth number two. Eat a little less of everything. Now, this is the kind of advice that's not going to get me any money, but that's okay. All right? Well, I can... This is also known as moderation. Now, the thing about moderation is moderation is boring and moderation is hard. Okay? Like, just, just as an example. So, pasta, for whatever reason, is served in 75 gram portions. Now, I don't know about you, I don't weigh my pasta. But they're sold in 500 gram packs. So you're there and you're kind of shaking, the, the, and the whole 500 grams goes in. Oh my God, all, all of it is in, right? So anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about. When I talk about moderation, there is a big movement today of people removing entire food groups, entire food groups from their diet for no clinical reason whatsoever, all right? And we know, and so I want to talk to you guys about two of those because I can spend the entire talk talking, talk, talking about this. I'm going to focus on two. I'm going to focus on dairy. Is dairy bad for you per se, the argument being that we're not designed to drink the milk of other, of, of other creatures and we're not designed to drink milk past, uh, uh, past childhood. Let's, let's examine those. And the removal of animal-based protein, being vegan. Okay, now, I'm going to tackle this, these two just very briefly. They're very hot-button topics, so maybe this is a bit of a risk, but just, just very briefly to speak about the health aspects. Now, we've all seen versions of this um, um, everywhere and on all the various foods, and yes, if you're a celiac, 1% of the human species are celiac. Maybe another 3 to 4% of the human species are, glu are gluten intolerant. It's a real thing. It's not an imagined thing. Okay? But yet 25% of us, oh my lord, 25% of us, in North, certainly in North America and here in Europe, buy gluten-free to some degree. So much so, they've begun to use it as a selling technique. Gluten-free water. Okay? Rice, naturally gluten-free. Gluten-free shampoo. Come on! I mean, like, like it's, a, it's, a, it's a real... Anyway, focus. I'm not focusing. I'm not focusing. So let's talk about um, lactose. Now, I happen to be Chinese, okay? I happen to be Chinese, and so I'm lactose intolerant. So let's actually w w work on lactose for a moment. So the, the dairy market today is very interesting. So 20% of dairy products, 20% of dairy products did not emerge from a cow or goat or a sheep. Okay? They emerge from plants. There are many, many plant-based products that are out there. Now, I happen to be Chinese, and so I have drunk soy milk all my life, although Chinese people never called it milk. We called it a broth, and we certainly wouldn't have poured it, like you white people do, into, into coffee. But you, can, you guys do what you want to do. All right? So that's fine. Okay, soy, soy is good. But then there are some amazing products. Quinoa milk. How do you milk a quinoa? I'm, I'm just, it's, it's just... Anyway, right. In fact, you can now have, other supermarkets are available, have an entire free from Christmas or celebration at these supermarkets. You can have a Christmas of absolutely nothing. Fantastic. Anyway, focus. I'm not focusing. So, okay, lactose intolerance, which I am because I'm Chinese, is a very inter interesting term, all right? Um, because all, in fact, it's a, li a little bit of a misnomer because actually all of us as mammals clearly can drink milk as 
babies. Okay, this is our, one, of our, one of our defining, defining creatures. But actually, as we get older, the vast majority of mammals, including most human beings, two thirds of the human beings on Earth, become lactose intolerant as we get into adulthood. So the question is why? Oh, the question is how first. Let's do the how first. So now lactose is a sugar found in milk, all right? And mammals cannot absorb lactose without it being digested. And it's digested, metabolized, by an enzyme called lactase, okay? So lactase sits around the gut lining and lactose goes by, it breaks it into two, you absorb it, yay. But at some point when you get older, and another protein comes and binds upstream of lactase, shutting it off, okay? So that in people like me, for example, we no longer can drink milk. I can no longer drink certainly large amounts of milk as an adult because my lactase is now shut off. Why? Probably to move university-age Johnny off the boob, you know, to, to, to kind of make room for, for little Johnny. There's limited space, okay? And I, th I think you need to incentivize a rapidly growing mammal um, to, to begin to eat solid food. I think this is probably the, 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 the real reason. Now, okay, then you know the European white people out there going, hey, wait a minute, how about, how come we can drink milk? Well, everything changed with the domestication of large mammals, ruminants in particular, so cow, sheep, goats. And people begin to realize, hang on a second. If we can actually eat, drink the milk before we eat the cow, for example, we'd get a lot more calories. And that's true. So the paleo agriculturists out there, it is a thing, have estimated that a Neolithic cow produces something along the lines of six to 700 liters of milk um, per, um, per annum, okay? Now, if you actually take just the calories in the milk, you know, in the lifetime of a cow, that's 10 times the amount of calories you're gonna find in the cow. Now, given that we never had enough food to eat, having a completely new source of food suddenly emerge meant that it was a huge selective pressure, okay? So about, it was such a huge selective pressure that 7,500 years ago or so, all right, came into Northern Europe, a little mutation, one base pair change upstream of this lactase gene. And what happens is this mutation prevents the protein that comes from shutting off lactase from binding. So the protein can't bind. As a result, lactase cannot turn off. It's not turn off. And those people can drink milk as adults. 85% of Northern Europeans, up to 90 in this country, can drink milk as adults. Every single one of you has exactly the same mutation that came in 7,500 years ago upstream preventing lactase from being shut off. Therefore, you adapt it and are able to drink milk as adults, okay? You adapt it to a new food. So, latte or soy latte? Well, I'm gonna be drinking soy latte or black coffee, all right? Whereas, if you can drink milk as an adult, if you have the adaptation, all right, then just remember this. Lactose is lactose. It's like glucose, it's like sucrose, it's like fructose. It's a sugar, exactly the same, okay? So if you can and have adapted to digesting lactose as an adult, then it doesn't matter where it comes from. It can be human milk, ick, okay? Cow milk, goat milk, sheep milk, camel milk. If you have the adaptation, then drinking milk per se is not going to be bad for you. Now, clearly, if you have too much milk and too much cheese, there's a waistline issue, but that's a different debate and a different question for another day, all right? So, this is me, okay? So my other, in my non-day job, in my other non-day job, I, I'm a presenter on BBC's Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. And the Trust Me team asked me, well, could I investigate whether or not being vegan was healthy per se? Now, before people start throwing shoes at me, there are, veganism is a complex thing, and I think it's, it's much discussed, and they're gonna be very, very good ethical and environmental reasons to be discussing veganism as well, okay, and, and, and for sure. But this was a health program, and so I will today just focus on the health elements of it, keeping, keeping uh, aside all of the other valid arguments that we might choose to do this, all right? So, is being vegan healthy per se? Is vegan food automatically healthy? Well, I think we think about it, we realize that that's not necessarily gonna be the case. Um, I went on a vegan diet for 29 days, not that I was counting, okay, and I, I could have eaten chips, and crisps for the entire time. That would have been vegan, but I don't think anyone would have considered this healthy, all right? I even found this amazing product. This is an amazing product, okay? So this is, um, these are bacon rashers, crispy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, for those of you who can't see it, no artificial flavorings and colorings. And 100% vegan, okay? I mean, it's amazing. Anyway, it turns out it's not 
it's no artificial bacon flavoring, but there we go. That's, that's, that's absolutely fine. So I could have eaten this, but I decided that, okay, I was going to go plant-based instead, meaning that I was going to eat whole grains and, and pulses and beans and, 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 and things like that, okay, as opposed to just pure, purely being vegan. So what happened? 29 days, plant-based vegan diet. I lost four kilograms. That's nearly 10, 11 pounds, okay, evenly throughout the four weeks. And my blood cholesterol levels dropped by 12%. My lord, I'm like, the, the, I should start an Instagram account. I should be tweeting, right? You know, you, you know about this. So clearly it was good for me. The question is, why? And I think it's always very, very important to take apart why I lost weight on the vegan diet. Now, as it turns out, because I stayed away from the more energy dense stuff, so chips and crisps, and I ate beans and lentils and what have you, well, you gotta eat a lot of lentils to match the, the calories of a steak. That's just it. The food is just a lot more bulky, okay? And there's only so much time in a day you can chew, right? And so, the reason why I lost weight is because I ate less, okay? I might have eaten more in terms of kilograms, but the food was bulkier and I actually had less calories, all right? Now, but so the, the vegan diet was not magical in that sense. It just was a very useful strategy for me to eat less. But it may not be for you. Some people prefer intermittent fasting. Some people prefer the Mediterranean diet. There are many other routes out there. For me, it was just a very good strategy. Cholesterol, why did it drop? Probably because I lost weight, all right? And so your, your cholesterol levels are going to track with your weight, and so that explains some of it. But the vast majority of the reason is because I gave up saturated fats which for me largely came from animal-based products. Now, there are going to be um, plant-based saturated fats as well, but I knew that I ate a lot of meat at, at, at the time, okay? But there are two big buts to this. First of all, I would have achieved exactly the same effect had I gone pescatarian, had I ate largely fish, because in fish, most of the fat is going to be unsaturated rather than saturated. So that's the first thing. And then the second big but is that there are going to be human beings out there, okay, some of you here in the audience, whose cholesterol levels are going to be insensitive to diet. Now, they, my cholesterol levels happen to be sensitive to diet, as I just uh, uh, showed you, but for those of you with the genes that mean that your, your cholesterol levels are insensitive, then just going on a vegan diet or something is not going to help it. You know, for some people, it is always going to have a pharmaceutical answer in order to lower, in order to lower your cholesterol levels. So this is what I'm saying. When you're considering a new diet, you're considering something, what are you doing it for? What is the purpose? Okay? And then you have to understand the biology of the diets, otherwise it may not end up working for you at all. Right. So your truth number three and number four, both A, it includes a prop, and B, I would argue that the next two truths explain how every single, if not, okay. Most, I'm going to say most, let's be a scientist here, how the vast majority, most of the diets work, work. Okay, now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen, Jess, can you give me a hand, a life-size knitted human gut before. Well, today's your lucky day. So, Jess here is going to give me a hand. So this, hold on. Your truth number three, food that takes longer to digest generally makes you feel fuller. And so this is understanding your food to poop tube. Okay, sorry about that. Yes. So this is your food to poop tube. You hold the, you hold the mouth side because I'm a gentleman. Okay, so here's the, so here's the food side. So, plus or minus, depending, depending on whether or not you're six foot five or you're five foot two, all right? This is on average, plus or minus a couple of feet, what is origami into all of us? Okay, this is the length of your gut. Okay, in all of you that is actually in here. And it's an amazing thing. And understanding how diets work involves understanding this, this tube. I didn't knit this A. B, I have the pattern for those of you who are interested. Okay, thanks, Jess. Right, so number three, your truth number three is that the longer something takes to go down this gut, the fuller it will make you feel. So let me give you an example. The Atkins diet. Now, the Atkins diet is famously low carb, low carb, I'm counting my carbs, blah, blah, blah. But actually, it is less about the fact that there are no carbs in there, or very low carbs, but more about what you replace it with. And people say, well, maybe I replace it with fat. Uh, yeah, probably, but fat per se is actually quite, in of itself, it's actually quite unpalatable. You're not gonna eat butter just by itself. But fat and carbohydrates mixed together, oh my lord, oh, you know, pastry, chocolate, pizza, you know, everything that's nice is a mix between fat and carbs. Anyway, but people replace it with protein. 
A calorie of protein makes you feel fuller than a calorie of carb. Sorry, start that again. A calorie of protein makes you feel fuller than a calorie of fat, than a calorie of carb, in that order, all right? The question is why? Well, protein, as it turns out, is just chemically more complex to pull apart, to digest, just, it, just, it just is. As a result, it takes longer chugging down the gut. Now, I told you about the signals that come from your gut informing your brain how much you've eaten. Well, as it turns out, most of these signals make you feel fuller. And so the longer the food takes to go down the gut, the more of these signals are given off, the fuller you feel. What happens when you feel full? You eat less. Okay, you eat less, clearly you actually lose weight. So this is how, actually, the vast majority, I'm skipping this, of these diets actually work, okay? Paleo, keto, carnivore, um, anything else that are, that are actually gonna be ba based on the eating, the high protein, low, you know, low carb, high fat, all of this works on the very basic principle that you increase the amount of protein, it just takes longer to digest, you feel fuller. Now, many of these things, they make up very exotic, uh, very, very exotic explanations for how some of these diets work, but it is almost entirely based on, based on, this, based on this fact, okay? So, your truth number four. So that's number three. Number four, don't blindly count calories. Now let's just consider what a calorie is, okay? So a calorie, for those of you who know your physics, is the amount of energy it takes to raise one liter of water, one degree Celsius at sea level, okay? So all calories are equal because they're a unit of energy. But the problem is we cannot access every single calorie. Now how do you calculate the amount of calorie in a food? Broadly speaking, we use a bomb calorimeter. And a bomb calorimeter is a sealed container in which you put food in it. If it's a wet food, you desiccate it, okay? It's, it's wrapped in a water jacket, okay, of a given volume. You then burn the food to a crisp, and then you measure the temperature rise in the water. And that is the amount of calories in the food, all right? The problem is, we are not bomb calorimeters, okay? Digestion is actually a relatively gentle, it's not gentle, a relatively gentle process, largely enzymatic. It's a biochemical reaction. It's not a bonfire. Okay? And so, whenever we talk about calories, we need to take into consideration caloric availability, which is the amount of calories you can absorb from a food versus the amount of calories totally present in a food. Okay? So let me give you some examples. Let's take sugar. A hun now, sugar is our most simple food because it's our base fuel. Okay? So if you have 100 calories of sugar, which is probably sucrose, one cut, it becomes glucose and fructose, and then you get absorbed. You probably get 99 calories for every 100 calories of sugar that you actually eat, all right? Now, let's take another example, sweet corn or corn on a cob. Now, we all know if you eat 100 calories of sweet corn, and then you look in the loo the next day, you clearly have absorbed nowhere close to 100 calories of sweet corn, all right? Now, yet, if you take sweet corn, you dry it, you make it into a corn meal, and then you convert it into a corn tortilla, suddenly a lot more of the calories are available. Yet, when you go to the supermarket to buy sugar, corn on the cob, or you know, popcorn kernels, or corn tortilla, and you look at the back of the package, all you get are bomb calorimeter numbers. 100 calories of sugar, 100 calories of sweet corn, and 100 calories of corn tortilla. If you were on some diet that, may, that meant that you could only eat 400 calories for lunch, for example, well then it makes a difference if you're eating 400 calories of sugar or 400 calories of sweet corn. Blindly counting calories makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Let me give you another example, okay? A fillet steak, okay, a steak. Say 400 calories, let's just go with 400 calories here. Now, if you don't murder the steak, okay, medium rare to, to, to well done if you must, it's probably what, four to five minutes to maybe 12 minutes to cook the steak, okay? Imagine, however, if you take exactly the same piece of meat, exactly the same piece of meat, ground it up, boil it for a couple of hours to make a tomato sauce, layer it into a lasagna, cook it for another couple of hours, freeze the lasagna, because who eats the whole lasagna, right? Heat it for another hour and then eat it. Imagine the same piece of steak that's been cooked for five hours. You then release a lot more of the calories that are there. I love steak, I love lasagna, don't get me wrong. But blindly counting calories, bomb calorimeter numbers, I want to argue, makes absolutely no sense 
whatsoever. And in fact, this is how caloric availability is how these diets work. So I already talked about my vegan diet, okay? Lentils are just hugely calorically un un unavailable. They're like sweet corn. They go in like a flying saucer, they come out like a flying saucer, you know? And so you just, they're very, very calorically uh, uh, unavailable. That's why I lost weight, and because I reduced the caloric availability of my food. That's how the Mediterranean diet works, okay? And actually, that's also in part how protein works. So a hundred, Carbohydrates, depending on refined, 99% available, or complex, so in a starch or whole meal form, is probably carbohydrates, 95% available, 195 calories for every 100, versus fat, which is nearly 100%, so 100 calories for, for 100 calories of fat because it's our energy storage. But for protein, depending on how you cook it, it's always ever only going to be 70% available, which means that for every 100 calories of protein you eat, you will only ever absorb 70 calories of, um, of it, all right? And so that is also how, and you can actually explain caloric availability to how the diets work. And those two points, the longer something takes to digest, it makes you feel fuller, and the caloric availability of the food explains how the vast majority of diets work. Just those two simple principles. When the new year, new you, new you, new year diet comes along, and someone's trying to sell you a diet, just think about it and reflect upon it. Does this give me food that is less calorically available, high in protein, you know, et cetera, et cetera? That's probably how it works. And just one thing before I just close off in the last couple of points, is that people think protein, they think meat which obviously is, is highly dense uh, uh, for, 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 for meat, but all protein will have the same effect. It could come from tofu, it could come from beans, okay? It doesn't have to be meat. Meat just is, happens to be a dense, uh, uh, um, you, you, you dense calories, but it doesn't have to be meat, okay? So, um, just a couple more, um, and, then, and, then I'll, and then I'll wrap up. Um, eat more unsaturated fats. Now this I already touched with, um, once again with the, with, the vegan, with the vegan explanation. Unsaturated fats tend to come from plant-based foods, avocados, um, you know, nuts, olive oil, and as I said, fish. And what we now know is that if you shift the ratio between unsaturated fats and saturated fats, eating more unsaturated fats, you reduce what we're calling all-cause mortality deadness. <laughs> you reduce the chances of dying. And now the mechanisms are complex, as you might imagine, but the epidemiology, the population studies are unequivocal. The more unsaturated fats than saturated fats you eat, it actually, it actually increases your chances of not being dead, which is, a, I think we all can argue, is a good thing, plausibly speaking. All right? And the final your truth is don't fear food. And I, I think we agree. I think we're in agreement that we're in a situation where the food has become so toxic and arguing, we begin, we begin to fear it. So, for example, Goop. I don't want to drive clicks to Goop, okay? Now, Goop is Gwyneth Paltrow's lifestyle um, um, web page thing we bought, okay? And on it, and I'm not making this up, you can Google this, she is trying to sell achieving your leanest livable weight. That's as skinny as you can get without dying, isn't it? I mean, what kind of dietary approach is that? Let's just eat as little as possible to avoid dying. It's just stupid. Look, look, is it true that the vast majority of non-communicable diseases today, okay, is diet-related? Yes, undoubtedly, all right? So in order to fix, this includes obesity, type 2 diabetes, certain cancers, high blood pressure, okay? Now I'm not denying this at all. But why do we then try and fix the problem with our diet? By fearing our food. What I've just been speaking about, okay, is not the fear of food, it's understanding it. I don't mind being on a vegan diet. Maybe someone needs to eat more protein. Maybe someone needs to be eating more this or more that. I'm trying to understand how a diet works with me. Understanding how a diet works with you. We need to learn to love our food. Understand our food, just eat a little less of it, right? <laughs> In terms of that. But that is going to be absolutely, absolutely true. So, this is the book, guys, and I'm signing at the, um, the bookshop, which is by that enormous plane, okay, I I immediately, immediately uh, after this. So, how do we then go about losing weight? Because I I'm cognizant that I haven't given you a solution. But I don't have a solution for every one of you universally. That's my point, okay? So the first thing is, you have to do you. You have to, well, are you rich? Are you poor? Are you overprivileged, underprivileged, okay? Do you work shifts? Do you cycle to work? Are you a parent? Are you not? Are you postmenopausal? Have you had a baby? You know, there are a gazillion things you have to think about that 
every diet is then going to change depending on where you are in life, who you are in life, what you do in life. You have to do you, all right? Secondly, now people say, my diet didn't work, my diet didn't work. Your diet didn't work because you came off the diet, okay? Because this, and this is the thing. Any diet which gets you to eat less, remember the physics, is a diet that works. The question is, can you keep the weight off, okay? Now that is a tricky, that's a tricky bit. So, very depressingly, I'm sorry, <laughs> in order for you to keep the weight off, you need to stay on that diet. You need to stay on that diet. So, it means that at the end of the day, if you do something extreme, the seven-day water fasting diet, that's a thing, okay? Now, if I went on the seven-day water fasting diet, would I lose weight? Yes, I'm gonna lose weight because I'm not eating. But the moment I stop, everything is actually gonna rush back on. So in order to actually do that, in order to actually think about that, then you actually need to lose weight gently, you need to lose weight sensibly, you need to lose weight in moderation. One final thought before I, actually, before I actually wrap up that people always ask me, and I think it's worth the while just bringing up, is why is carrying too much fat bad for you? And you might think, well, that's obvious. Tell me, right? And I think, here's the thing. Whenever we talk about weight gain and weight loss, there's a fundamental misunderstanding amongst many people. When you gain weight, you do not gain fat cells. This is not what happens, okay? People think, oh, I'm more fat cells, therefore making the fat cell the evil entity which it isn't. Fat cells are like balloons, okay? They grow bigger and they grow smaller depending on how big or how little you are. Now, the safest place to store fat is in the fat cell, right? Because it's a professional fat, cell, uh, fat, fat um, storage organ. It's when it's not in the fat cell, then it goes to your liver, it goes to your muscles, it goes to places it's not supposed to be, and then it causes trouble. But here's the interesting thing. Everybody's fat cells expand to differing amounts, okay? So for some people, you're gonna to get to a fat cell this size, and the fat is gonna leak out, so to speak, and then you're gonna become ill. This is why there's skinny people with type two diabetes, for example, all right? This is why famously, South Asians, East Asians, we cannot carry as much weight as uh, white people, as, as Polynesians. Our safe fat carrying capacity differs. However, some people's fat cells can get enormous, okay, before they actually become ill. Okay, Polynesians, classic example, all right? Or those guys who have to be craned out of their house because they've reached 400 kilograms. None of us here will get to 400 kilograms because we'd be dead before, before, before that. But those people have a higher safe fat carrying capacity, okay? So people say health at every size. In a room this size, there is gonna be health at many sizes. But for you, yourself, there is no health at every size. At some point, if you go past your safe fat carrying capacity, you will become ill, okay? The trick is to try and tell where that is, and that is the subject of cutting ed uh, edge research by my colleagues in Cambridge uh, um, at the moment, trying to understand that very fine line to try and give a more sophisticated explanation to what obesity means, to why it's dangerous, and to what it means for you, for me, and for everybody else. So to close, I want to misquote someone, okay? Everything in moderation, including moderation. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.